the cloud. Okay, we are recording. Um, hello, everyone. We are about to get started, and I have just started the recording. I am your session MC, and my name is Alexa Height. Uh, please keep your videos and microphones muted unless you have a question during the Q&A portion of each of our presentations. Um, this session is being live captioned, and I will copy and paste our code of conduct and IT support email uh, shortly. Um, I invite you to use the chat to say hello and introduce yourselves and where you are joining from. I am in Corpus Christi. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions and share comments and resources. I love all the resources that have been shared thus far. Uh, you may also ask for assistance in chat or ask questions anonymously by messaging me directly in the chat. We will have time at the end of uh, for Q&A, and we'll save your questions for our speakers until then. I will do my best to acknowledge questions as received and ask your questions in the order that I receive them. Uh, presenters are welcome to answer questions directly in the chat. Um, and now we are going to begin recording. Oh, I was supposed to wait until that. Um, welcome to today, today's session of Open Texas 2022. I am Alexa Height with the Open Texas Conference Committee, and I'm emceeing this session. Thank you for joining us today for our show and fail uh, session. Again, please mute your microphones and turn off your video feed. Um, and I am going to stop sharing so I can let our first presenter, Amanda, um, take us away. I hate that when you share, the Zoom makes everything go crazy. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Larson, and I will be presenting today. No matter how you build it, they won't come. So who am I? I am Amanda Larson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the Affordable Learning Instructional Consultant at The Ohio State University. I'm located in Columbus, Ohio. Um, if you would like to reach me, you can do so at either at Mavar on Twitter or um, my email address is there. And then I also have put together a link tree, which I'm sharing in the chat now. Um, and that has a link to my presentation and then also all of the links inside of the presentation. So they're all in one spot for y'all. So I'm just going to start with getting us all on board with sort of like the same definitions of open pedagogy because the project I was working on was open pedagogy based. So my two favorite definitions that I use all of the time are Catherine Cronin's use, reuse, creation of OER and collaborative pedagogical practices employing social and participatory technologies for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation and sharing, and the empowerment of learners. Um, and then also Robin and Dr. Rosa's and Rajiv Janiani's um, definition from Open Pedagogy at the Open Pedagogy Notebook, a site of practice, a place where theories about learning, teaching, technology, and social justice enter into a conversation with each other and inform the development of educational practices and structures. And then more specifically about how students engage as an accent access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education and as a process of designing architectures and using tools for learning that enables students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. We might insist on the centrality of the five R's, those are David Wiley's five R's, to this work. Of those definitions, I take away that we are trying to build classrooms and courses that provide students a place to really practice the knowledge that they are learning in a way where they are driving that conversation and um, they are able to make choices and then also transfer knowledge based on those choices that they make. So the project brief of what I was asked to do, um, I was asked to create a community of interest and the community of interest was explained to me as being an opportunity for library faculty and staff to join a themed community. So in this case, it would have been on open pedagogy um, that would run for a course of two to three weeks 
They would participate in discussion on the topic and develop a greater understanding of its potential for improving their practice. And there was a goal that they would create some sort of artifact or project at the end or afterwards. In addition to that, I was expected to facilitate synchronous virtual sessions. So as in addition to whatever professional development was happening, I was also anticipating running four to six virtual Zoom sessions across the week. So the road to failure, what went wrong? We're gonna explore that. So I was invited to create this community of interest by the teaching and learning committee at my library. And the first thing I did was I reached out to clarify expectations. Had there been any of these set up previously? How had they run um, before I started thinking about what I might build? And then I agreed to do this. And the agreement was that I would create the stuff and they would do like all of the lifting for like um, advertising and getting people in seats necessarily. Uh, so then I went away and I did some brainstorming and I asked myself, what would my audience need to know? Um, how can I best teach open pedagogy to other librarians at my institution? What scaffolding, scaffolding would be needed in that process? And then I started um, thinking, well, it would be really cool to build this inside Canvas where they could go through modules and they could really experience open pedagogy as part of the process so that they would have sort of lived experience and would understand what other instructors might want their students to do and how they could help with that. So I built a course in Canvas and um, I also planned out what the Zoom sessions would look like. And then I um, was really, um sort of just on my own and i ended up having to draft all of the publication materials to advertise it and i sent out the open registration through a library-wide listserv so what did i build um i built a canvas course it consists of four modules uh, the first one is open education basics so i thought if i was going to bring people into the space where they needed to think about open pedagogy, they really needed to understand open licensing and how OER itself sort of works in the space at Ohio State. And so that module started with a pre-survey and it's sort of just like, hey, what do you know about any of this? So I have an idea of like how to build out for those facilitated discussions. And then what is open pedagogy? So working through definitions and sort of collaboratively coming together um, to build a definition, a working definition that we would use as we continue to discuss this. And then I wanted to have them have two options for takeaways. The first one is supporting instructors with open pedagogy. So if an instructor came to them and was interested in open pedagogy, how could they support that instructor to figure that out for their class? Even if that was just a referral to me, I would have been happy with them walking away knowing that knowledge. And then module four was open pedagogy and library instruction. So how could they incorporate those things into their one shot library instructions? Or if they are teaching credit bearing courses, how could they incorporate it into that as well? So as part of that, I built out some assignments. So there was obviously the pre survey that I talked about and a facilitated discussion around definitions. And then I wanted them to try out social annotation. That's my go-to recommendation for replacing a disposable assignment with a renewable assignment is, hey, let's try hypothesis and maybe get rid of a discussion board post. Um, and then I had them, I was going to have them work on building a worksheet template that they could use with instructors so that they had a set list of things and common questions that they would ask if an instructor came for help. And then for a final project, I had envisioned them creating or, or modifying a lesson plan for library instruction. So maybe they would go to Project Cora and find an openly licensed library instruction lesson and then revise it to meet their needs and also to include some open pedagogy elements. And then um, I had a post survey to see, to assess where they had come from. And then I also had four sessions built out for the discussion of the week's topic or for them to ask me any questions during that time. And it was just gonna be space that was held for them to really be able to engage as deeply as they wanted to. So the breaking point, again, advertisement. 
So just my single registration to news notes went out. There wasn't any of the support that I was promised. Um, and then at the same time, COVID was just happening and we had just all transitioned to work from home. Um, and people might have been burnt out from all of the professional development that was cropping up simultaneously and we were like burdened with choice. And then culture issue. Um, so folks are burnt out at with that, but also um, there's a culture of people not attending things at our library, even when they say they want to. So I love failure. When I saw that there was gonna be a, a show and fail, I was so excited because I love talking about failing. So what ended up happening is that I had to cancel the registration because only one person signed up. And in order for the assignments to work, I needed at least four students so that they would be able to engage with each other. Um, and what I think is important about failure is like, really, things don't work out sometimes, and that's okay. But if you spend time making things, there are often ways that you can use those things later. So what have I done with the materials that I've made? Um, so. ALX is the Affordable Learning Exchange at our institution, and this last cohort of grant winners, they introduced a ALX, ALX Foundations course, and I was able to transition that material into an open education basics module and then the open pedagogy module, and so instructors were able to use that material. And then also related to um, ALX grant winners, I was able to transition some of that module content also into a new course called Teaching with OER that I used to support a first year writing program who's hoping to transition their whole program into using OER and open pedagogy in the classroom. And um, that's a really big win for the grant program, but it's also a really big win for like coming out of this failure. Um, and then as a group in teaching and learning, where my position is situated, uh, we built an instructor resources site and I was able to transition that module content into a web page for affordable educational resources so that it's still there broadly available to folks at my institution. And then even better, um, I was asked to create a course for KPU's professional program in open education. And a lot of the materials that I had created helped inform the creation of that supporting open education course, because I was able to really get a chance to try out that ethos of getting participants to experience an open pedagogy in the classroom before they go out and really support folks doing that work. And then my take are just over 10 minutes. Um, so okay. I'm going to let, let you keep talking. Um, but if there are any questions in chat, please share them. And then if we do have questions, yep. I'll cut you off so we can address those. Absolutely. So my takeaways are feel your feelings, sit with that disappointment and really allow yourself to feel that. I think too often we take away and we're like, I, you know, it was all my fault. I should have done X, Y, Z different. It's okay to feel disappointed. And then I communicate early and often. So that's what I took away is I needed to be in communication with those folks a lot more frequently. And then reuse and recycle content. You spend all of the time working on something. There's no reason why you can't use it to continue, and then iterate and grow on what you've built. Um, not succeeding at one particular workshop or professional development experience isn't the end of the world. And that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, again, if you do have questions, please share them in the chat. Okay, so um, Jackie has a question, what OER does the FYC program use primarily? So they're using a compilation of a bunch of different stuff that they found. There isn't one specific text that I can point you to. Um, they worked with a librarian to source some library resources as well as uh, hired a graduate assistant to help them curate OA, o, OER for the course. So unfortunately, I can't be like, they use this particular writing textbook, but they they built their own compilation and then instructors get to pick and choose from those what they use. Excellent, thank you. Um, just because we are so um, pressed for time in this session, I am going to pass it off to Carl and Meredith. Um, and once they get started, I will start the 10 minute timer for y'all.
Sorry, getting to the unmute button. So I am Carl Hess. I'm presenting with Dr. Meredith Bolden, director of our Sarah Writing Communication, though at the time we're talking about here, she was actually GA for the libraries on the grant that's mentioned in the title, which as you may notice, great minds think alike. This is if you build it, they might not come. So to kind of go through our kind of structure today, we're gonna to talk about first what was supposed to happen, what actually did happen, and what we took out of all of that. So the grant in question is a 2021 Tennessee Board of Regents Open Educational Resources grant given to the University of Memphis. And we've done the collaboration between the Department's of Education, English, Mathematics, and the University Libraries. And the goal was to use OER to incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice into the curriculum as an outgrowth of a anti-racist movement that the University of Memphis started in 2020 and then was told to stop by the state of Tennessee, but that's a different show and fail. Anyway, so we're part of that, we were gonna implement OER sections of a few major general education courses. This we're gonna do two math courses, probability and statistics and college algebra, and two English courses, literary heritage and literary heritage African-American lit. And the job of the university libraries was going to be to provide training to the faculty and staff on OER. Now, this meant that over the time of 2021, during the spring, we were going to collect together resources, build our training, give them options for finding things for those four courses, overview basic OER concepts. Then in the summer, we would do a live session with the faculty from those two departments who would be re leading these sessions. And then as they worked on their curricula during the rest of the summer, we would provide one-on-one -on -one need, you know, support as needed so that by the time they come into the fall and teach those courses, they would be ready to go. Now we were given in the grant language an explicit requirement to train at least 25 participants as part of the assessment. The other departments who are actually incorporating this did not have requirements for number of sections led, number of faculty involved, number of faculty will be trained, and foreshadowing, that's going to come up as Meredith talks about what actually happened. Which was delightful. <clears throat> Can you go to the next slide, Carl? Uh, as Carl mentioned, uh, our first step was to essentially understand what OER was. Um, I was the first employee hired on the grant. Carl came in shortly thereafter, and I had no idea what formal OER was. So I did several months of research. I started compiling all of this information into uh, the LibGuide that you see the homepage for right here. Carl has since um, broadly, broadly expanded it, and it's amazing and wonderful and all the things. but. This was the kind of um, the basis for what our training was going to look like eventually when we got to that part in the grant where we would actually be training the faculty. Carl, next slide. Um, one of the key components uh, and one of the main reasons why we were able to get this grant was again, the inclusion or the focus, if you will, on DEI and we had the support of our diversity officer, um, who's the vice president of student academic success. She wasn't actually one of the PIs, but she was sort of tangentially kind of uh, pushing us from the sidelines to get this work done. Um, and in the meantime, the lead PI for the grant was supposed to compose the DEI material and research um, that we were gonna link out to. Uh, in our training and on the LibGuide. And we waited and we waited and we waited some more. And finally, the week before uh, our meeting with our provost, if you move to the next slide, I was asked to uh, add information myself as the GA. So instead of the actual PI who's full-time faculty, I was asked as, as the GA to compose for um, compile this DEI information. So what you see on the left is just simply the tabs for DEI, um, some of the research that we found, as well as some of the initiatives, both statewide and here at the University of Memphis in terms of DEI and OER. On the right, you also see that uh, during the second round of this grant, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, I was again asked to compose the DEI material, uh, some of which I plagiarized slash borrowed from the original grant language and some of which I composed myself. Next slide. 
As Carl mentioned, our training did not exactly turn out the way we thought it was going to. Explicitly uh, in the grant materials, we were supposed to train 25 faculty, which we assumed would be coming from the math and English departments, since those were the faculty who would be piloting the OER in the fall of 2021. However, after we were able to present this material, um, move to the next slide, please, sir. We wound up uh, being told by our PIs outside of our PI here at the library that none of the faculty in either the English or the math departments actually needed OER training. Instead, uh, the Dean of Libraries, who was our immediate um, boss, if you will, had us pilot the training at the Library Administrative Council meeting to the research and instructional staff, uh, both of whom Carl and I work slash worked for. We had an open library all invitation to a hybrid session that we conducted in an instructional room here at the main library. And then I wound up having a one-off session with one of the English instructors who was recruited two weeks before school started um, to find some of the OER. She had no idea where to look, no idea about the licensing, none, none of the things that we were gonna do the training for back in the spring. Ultimately, we recorded our hybrid session and posted it to the libguide that we had already created. Next slide. One of the other things that we had been asked to do, I uh, wasn't explicitly a part of the grant uh, language, but we were asked to compile the OER that had been used during these pilot sections of the English and math courses. One of the English instructors moved away before anyone asked her to hand over the OER or the links to the OER that she had used for her course. I could not get the name of the second instructor until the last week of the grant. And we discovered that the both the PI and the GAs who worked on the math OER, they created their own for both courses. They did not understand the basic concepts of Creative Commons licensing, sharing the materials, and they were unwilling to share them with me for the purposes of republishing them, even on our own like University of Memphis hubs on Merlot and OER Commons. So ultimately we just dropped it. These are screenshots of OER Commons, our modules for those departments, and you see that they're all empty. We also discovered, so in the spring of this year, I had already graduated, but I was contacted by our dean at here at the library again. And he said that there was a final project, there was some money left over, we were asked to create a quick start guide for the faculty. Um, during this process, I discovered that the Tennessee Board of Regents had also offered a grant to another set of PIs here on campus. And I contacted contacted our lead PI and I said, hey, so they don't have to, you know, duplicate all those months of research. Um, could we just get in touch with them and let them know that, you know, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And this is a direct quote from the email that I received in reply that it was not time efficient to initiate that relationship. Instead, I sent this person a list of the faculty and um, their email addresses in the event that they ever wanted to collaborate at some point in the future. Next slide. As for this quick start guide, this is the delight or my absolute delight of our entire grant process. Again, we were at the tail end of the grant. The funding was gonna be returned to the state at the end of our fiscal year if we didn't use it. <clears throat> Without consulting Carl, who has access to the usage statistics for our LibGuide, they told me that faculty were not using the LibGuide and that we needed to create a quote print document. They recruited one GA from instructional design to assist me with this process. And we spent the better part of two months uh, creating site guide, um, including with interactive uh, like assignments, if you will, a reflection page, QR codes for the various websites that we um, were consulting to our various hubs in Merlot and OER Commons, so forth and so on. I asked during the course of this process if the grant would also be paying to um, print the, the print document and was told that unless a different department was going to pay for it, then no. Ultimately, you will see on the next slide, I laugh every time I see this, but this is again our homepage to our OER LibGuide, and that is where the quick start guide ended. 
And that is also where it is today. It's not been printed or distributed to the faculty on our campus. It's in the same place that we were told originally faculty are not quote using. <laughs> Nathan, I love that. Um, that's all for me folks, but it was amazing. It was truly amazing. You are just at time. So all right. beautiful. So that I'll just, if, if there are questions come in, but I've got to finish off the last little bit what we took out of this. So basically what we learned, you know, don't, you know, faculty might assume they know a lot more about OER than they actually do. As we found out, don't assume your collaborators interpreting the grant requirements the same way you do and make sure to get explicit commitments from them in the roles, including in the grant language. And then, you know, from what we able to use that we still use the guide, it has gotten usage despite others beliefs. And at least the training materials we've been able to reuse for a series of presentations with UM3D, our campus instructional design educational technology support office. I was last spring working with members of the English subcommittee for lower division curriculum who are actually working on those same two courses and trying to make OER sections of them. And I was able to share them all of Meredith's work, which they did not know about. And Meredith mentioned that other grant, thankfully a member of that grant is part of UM3D and she put me in contact with the PI so I could train her on things like Creative Commons and other fun such things. We do have a question in the chat. Um, Elizabeth asks, why not make the faculty quick start guide OER? And somebody else is interested in that question as well. It is. You mean make it like license it as an OER? I'm not sure. Elizabeth, if you yeah. want to unmute and clarify your question. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, host in Pressbooks or another. So it is licensed as a Creative Commons. It does, we haven't moved much with it because some of it is very specific to just processes at the University of Memphis, but we could make it more available and adapt. And we could probably use a free Pressbook thing since we do not have a institutional Pressbook account, but there are probably ways we could make it more widely available. But it's also just kind of a summarization of the stuff that's on the guide, which is also Creative Commons licensed and freely available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything that we've created is is licensed, just a by license. Um, Justin, so that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that de definitely does make sense. Um, again, for time's sake, um, I'm going to move on and hand it off to Angela. I really feel for you. <laughs> that sounds so so tough but that's why we're here we're talking about lessons learned showing and failing so angela take it away okay thanks so much um hello everyone my name is angela lucero um, i'm the scholarly communication librarian and head of research and instruction at a uh, library here at utep um today i'm talking about um well when i when i heard that we were going to that there was going to be a show and fail session, I was really excited because um, there was this incentive program that I was the co-director of and it, it did fail, you know, it didn't achieve what it was, what it meant, what we meant for it to. And I spent a lot of time, you know, examining, you know, the, the whole, the whole timeline. And so I'm really glad to be able to talk about it. And um, hopefully you can avoid some of these, uh, some of these missteps. And I think that, you know, soon we'll notice some themes. So um, I want to start by, I'll just give a quick overview of like my expectation. So um, this started, thoughts about this started in 2019. So in Texas, you know, if, if, um, if academic institutions hadn't already, you know, started to um, address OER or, or, or think about it, they were starting now because of legislation. And that's where we were at UTEP. So um, you know, there was no, there's no culture of openness um, on campus. And so, you know, no one, ever, very, many people were hesitant to try OER. And so what we thought is, you know what, let's incentivize it. And, you know, once there are examples, maybe some peer pressure, maybe some like uh, support groups or something could be, could be created from that. And so, you know, um, I was really lucky that, that someone who's very charismatic, a really cool person to work 
with um, heard me talking about OER in the provost's office and pulled me aside and said, Angela, let's let's get this done. Let's start an incentive uh, an incentive program for this. Um, and so we we kind of um, placed OER and affordable course materials, which are just you know other uh, free free or, or affordable low cost things. Um, in an incentive grant, like in an existing in the existing structure of an incentive, um, an incentive program that existed in our academic, our sort of academic technology unit. And so at the top, you'll see we had the funding, you know, I was convinced, you know, we have the librarian expertise, we're going to be able to show it off here. Um, there were a bunch of participants, um, you know, we had a lot of applicants um, when we put out an open RFA. Um, I, we, you know, we said we want to help you adopt OER and other affordable resources. And so the goal is to like transform the campus culture around um, OER, perceptions of OER and, and just openness in general. Um, what really happened was, you know, we started out at this point, OER, I don't know her, you know, is that just free? And, you know, uh, we encountered lots of obstacles along the way, you know, the open RFA was one of them. Um, many times I, you know, was thinking or saying or trying not to say that's not OER, this isn't OER. Um, the pandemic did happen in the middle of the, the co of the incentive program. Um, so, you know, that obviously threw in some problems. Uh, I made a lot of concessions in the name of collaboration when we were planning and, and while we were running this. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. And uh, it was clear towards the end that participants didn't grasp the expectations that were that were stated that they did sign off to um, in the beginning of the incentive program. And so that did lead to failure. And so I want to talk about um, the incentive program that we were running, uh, just to kind of frame this really quickly. So this was my expectation. I had, I had really high hopes for this. So I thought that in the summer um, and early fall of 2019 that we would put out our RFA, recruit participants, and that time would go into preparing my colleagues, the librarians, um, to support people, um, to support the participants. I heard, um, I believe it was Deanne Ivey um, say at a conference once, uh, do not try and do OER alone. Don't be the only person who does that at your institution. Um, you know, and I, I, and I took her, I took her seriously. So I said, you know what, I can coordinate this, but I can make, you know, all the librarians, you know, conversant enough in this that they can, they can do that. They can, we all can do it together. And so there was training to prepare them there, um, in the summer. Um, and so we chose the participants uh, in the fall, from fall to summer, that was the time that we had to curate um, OER or other affordable options for the uh, participants to implement in, in their courses. And uh, they were also working on some other things, you know, clarifying their course objectives, um, you know, implementing things in Blackboard. And, and there, were, there was a lot of other stuff uh, that went into it, but, you know, we had a really long runway for this. Um, and then in fall of 2020, it was the goal that the instructors would implement the OER or affordable materials that they had chosen um, and, and use them as the uh, required instructional materials. And then in the fall, it was my goal to harvest um, anything that was adapted or, or, or to make you know, to make something that was shareable uh, for every participant so that we could put that in our repository so that you know, we could kind of show, look, this is the work that went into it and, and, and everyone could feel very proud of that. Okay, so that was the expectation. Obviously, it didn't turn out this way. Uh, here's what really happened. It's it's red because um, there are feelings, you know. Um, so this, there's a lot on the screen here. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning, and I, I'm just going to summarize. So the RFA was open to anyone who teaches. It was not just faculty, tenure track faculty. Um, it was open to to those to that group, yes, but um, to lecturers, to TAs, to adjuncts, you know, to any classification the the, the requirement was, you know, if, if you teach a class, you can come in and you can come and um, apply uh, for this incentive program. Um, when we were reviewing applications, there was a big uh, group that was uh, selecting participants. And um, so there was no opportunity, it, you know, it was, it was kind of a fed out to groups. So every group of, of selectors 
would receive five applications and would rate those. So I was in a group of selectors and I, I did not get to see all of the applications, you know, so I, I did not know. And, and I realized that this was, I realized this was the way the application uh, process was structured far too late. Um, and I was concerned about the feasibility of, of you know, applicants' proposals. And um, so many people, you know, were accepted into the program and they were not on board to just adopt or adapt, they were on board to create, which, you know, was not something we were prepared to support. So that's something that went, uh, that happened in the very beginning. Um, next step on, you know, fall to summer, um, the librarians, my colleagues were prepared in training, uh, but they still needed more support. And we had like 18 active participants in this cohort. Um, and so it was not a one-to-one -one situation. Uh, my colleagues, the librarians need more support uh, from me and there was not enough me to spread around at that point. Um, in the name of collaboration, uh, this is a really big one. I agreed to forego what was called intense OER education for participants. And I really wanted to do this, you know, to, to, to head off some problems that I, I thought you know, might happen if we all maybe didn't have the same understanding of what OER or affordable materials were. Um, but there was kind of some pressure to, you know, be cool, Angela, don't micromanage, Angela. Um, and, you know, everyone here feels pretty confident that they know what OER is. And so in the name of collaboration, I, I stepped back and I said, okay, you know what, like we can address this on a one-to-one, -one. like it, it's fine, we can still, no, we did not, we did not address it. Um, people were not ever adequately trained or educated on what OER is or isn't or what affordable means um, in, this, in this entire process. Um, so next, looking at fall 2020, um, too many, like, like I said, you know, there were too many participants, there were 18, um, and there were not enough of me to coordinate. I, I did have a co-director, but the things that I was concerned about, you know, figuring out, um, you know, what course materials are they using currently and what do they want to transition to? You know, what is what are their goals? It was hard for me to collect that information. We didn't have a system for you know depositing all of that into one place. Um, there was not communication going on with my colleagues, the other librarians, like it was supposed to uh, be happening. And it was really hard for me to connect, you know, one on one with them because of time, because of you know uh, everyone else is busy. And and so shorthand, you know, the pandemic also like th threw a big wrench into this already messy, you know, uh, complex situation. Um, and so overall, you know, the program really scaled back its engagement with the participants um, starting in the fall. You know, uh, it was just, you know, it was a stressful time. Everyone remembers that. And so that, that made sense at the time. When it came time uh, for me to check in and see what was actually used and try to harvest materials, I found that there was nothing I could harvest. Uh, some people had adopted straight out, you know, some OER materials, but other things were open access that you could not reuse or share or modify. Some things were straight up copyrighted material put into um, so something that uh, someone called a, a new textbook. And, you know, there are lots of problems there, you know, mostly with the intellectual property. And so I couldn't even address that, but shorthand, there was nothing to harvest. Um, not a great situation. Um, we really just wanted to make sure at this point that people were able to teach their classes, um, they had the materials that they needed and that the students were able to, you know, complete those courses. And, and that did happen, but it wasn't always with OER. Now, we are over 10 minutes, but again, Oof. we don't have any questions in the chat just yet. So I'll mm -hmm. let you keep talking. And if questions do appear, I'll cut you off. Okay, I am almost done. So how you can avoid these mistakes. First of all, choose your participants very intentionally. Um, you know, choose someone who has, choose people who can make decisions about the course materials that are used. Insist on OER education for everyone involved. You know, uh, direct, uh, you know, anyone who's directing, you know, a, uh, an incentive program, anyone who's working, you know, needs to have a baseline education on, on what is OER and, and what kind of materials are allowed. I'd say even licensing, you know, um, tutorials or, or something on intellectual property, um, because we're not all on the same level. That's just, I, I believe that's just how it is everywhere. Um, frequent communication and check-ins with participants are, are a must just for maintaining that collect, uh, 
maintaining that connection, um, sharing information, uh, collaboration, maintaining momentum, you know, you've got to keep up with that. I mean, hopefully there's not another pandemic, you know, when you try this. Um, and then also communicate participant expectations clearly and often. Um, that way it's a reminder, you know, uh, remember you do need to share this thing that you're creating at the very end. No, it's not negotiable. Um, remember, you said you would implement it during the semester. You know, little things like that. Um, I think it bears repeating, even if they've, even if you have their signature. You know, a reinforcement is good. And then at the at the bottom of the screen, I have uh, some text that says small cohorts are okay. In the beginning, I was super excited that we were going to have eighteen participants, but there needed to be more people to support 18 participants. So if you don't have a lot of staff, having a small group in your incentive program, I think is probably preferable because you can manage that and give it the attention it deserves. Um, I hope that this has been useful for you. Um, I'm really glad to have been able to talk about it. If you wanna talk more, um, my name and my email address are on the screen. Um, and then there's another, um, there's something about expectations and reality that is in the public domain. And thank you all for your time. I hope that when you have the opportunity to have an incentive program, that it goes really well. Thank you so much. I, I'm just absolutely loving these presentations. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, working in higher ed and in, in libraries, I think we all are aware of, we're all doing so many things. And then mm -hmm. to try to take on more and start these these programs are always so ambitious so even if they fail like I I, I don't want to say we set ourselves up for failure because some of them do take off and they do do really well but you know there's there's just so many factors so um thank you all for sharing and last but not least I'm going to hand it over to Wilhelmina um and so take it away please Oh, hello. I'm Wilhelmina Ranke, and I'm head of library systems and technologies at Georgia Southern University. I previously was digital library services coordinator for several years at Florida Virtual Campus, and today I'm talking about Orange Grove Postmortem, discontinuation of Florida's open educational resources repository for K-20. Um, so first off, what was the Orange Grove? The Orange Grove was a repository of open educational resources. It formally launched in 2007 with about 500 learning objects. That was following a planning process which ran from around 2004 to 2007. Um, key principles that guided repository development was being able to meet SCORM standards. So being able to, if someone completes a lesson to feed that information to a learning management system. Um, quality assurance process for included materials following basic metadata standards, um, a focus on building user community, the idea that content requires management, um, content must be reusable in new teaching environments and providing training in how to use the system. So we can flash forward to about two years ago, the Orange Grove was decommissioned on August 31st, 2020. And this presentation is about leading up to that. So, the immediate crisis reason for the specific decommissioning date was that on July 1st, 2020, the governor of Florida defunded the Florida Virtual Campus Consortium as the FLVC. The FLVC did central library technology and distance learning for Florida State College and State University systems. It still does. It's been funded again after one year without a budget. Um, and it used to host the Orange Grove. But this defunding is not the whole story. I'd worked with digital publishing at FLVC and the vast majority of publishing programs got funded through chargebacks to colleges and universities that were voluntary. Basically after defunding, FLVC provided basic information about each service it provided and provided the cost information to the college and university system and the member institutions voted on what to fund or not fund. And for a year, FLVC was on a chargeback model. Uh, other digital publishing programs like Florida Online Journals, which is journal publishing, and the Islandora Digital Library Platform were funded on a chargeback model. And almost universally, FLVC's services were funded on a chargeback model. Institutions scrambled, people went to their provost and got money allocated. Orange Grove got nixed. It, no, people did not want to fund it on a chargeback model. Libraries, directors, and deans voted, and pretty much Orange Grove didn't get funding. So there's a whole community aspect and a journey that went from vibrant and building a buzz in 2007 to having a buzz to being seen as irrelevant. 
And this presentation is about the journey from vibrant to forgotten. So I want to start with a striking statistic. At takedown in August 2020, approximately 20% 20 of the original content in the Orange Grove was in the Flash format. Um, my actual statistic was that 20.8% of items were in a Flash format as of that takedown date. This percentage is a little bit like reading tea leaves. Um, in August 2020, when Orange Grove was decommissioned, there were 707 items in Orange Grove to where there was a metadata record and there was a file or files associated with that. There were also a lot of harvested resources that were metadata only, but I didn't look at those. Um, the vast majority of those 707 items were multi-part. About the only learning objects where there would be one file would be a PDF of a textbook, and even most of the textbooks would have a PDF plus an EPUB plus a a text file in a lot of different formats. Um, most of the objects in there were multi-part things. So there were items like websites, would be several HTML files that act as a wrapper to hold together images, documents, flash files, videos, things like that, um, and all kinds of different content. There were zip files that would have a whole course or a workshop or a, a lesson plan inside of them, and all of the files for that inside of that zip file. So to get to that approximately 20%, I looked at each item and I noted what I thought was the dominant format for the object. Five different people looking at what was in there would probably come up with different statistics. Nevertheless, Orange Grove had a lot of flash format files for fall 2022. Or sorry, fall 2020. For context, flash was the way to do things around 2004 to 2007 when Orange Grove launched. It was very interactive compared to HTML. In 2008, HTML5 came out, and HTML5 was modeled on the interactivity in Flash. Then in 2010, Apple said it wouldn't support Flash for iPads and iPhones. So right before that 2008 to 2010 timeframe, Flash was the dominant way to do interactive resources online. And after that 2008 to 2010 timeframe, Flash lost dominance. Then in 2017, Adobe, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla all jointly announced an end of life for Flash as of December, 2020. Um, and that wasn't just end of life in a fizzle. They actually like actively like said they were going to uninstall it from your computer and block it. So you like starting December 31st, 2020, no one could actually with a Windows computer run a flash file. So in August, 2020, when about 20% of items in the Orange Grove were in flash, that was also a few months before flash was gonna stop working completely on all US computers. The, the collection was a little long on the tooth. Um, and even beyond that, a lot of the Flash items in Orange Grove were not just Flash, but they were really old Flash. A lot of them would say to download the Flash player from Macromedia. Macromedia was acquired from Adobe in 2005, 15 years before the Orange Grove was decommissioned. So that statistic, 20% um, of the original content in Orange Grove being in Flash is almost the whole story. Captured right there, there's something unique and more ephemeral about good OER. Uh, Teachers want OER to be interactive beyond a handout or a diagram or a textbook. Teachers and professors want something interactive that will grade, get a grade, and especially take that grade and plug it into a class and into the learning management system. They don't just want like a PDF of a handout. Um, captured right there is startup efforts that fizzle. So we all know the story of a grant funded project that gets a big upfront infusion of cash, but then once that's gone, there's not ongoing funding or endowment for maintenance and project can just not get maintenance at all. Um, and capture right here, there's pressure to prioritize statistics and numerical growth over community. And easy statistic to get about any digital library is how many things are in it. That's much, much easier than it is to measure how easy is it to find things or how useful are things or what percent of items are useful. It's much easier to get a numerical count of how much is in it. Sometimes with pressure for growth and growth being measured by numbers rather than qualitative analysis, there can be pressure to keep the numbers going up and to not delete older content, even though deleting older content could remove clutter and improve the search experience for people using the site. Um, so I'll go into unique to OER, focus on interactivity. Um, I've worked extensively in digital publishing and something unique to OER is that a there's a tremendous demand for and value to interactivity. So when I was working more closely with OER, professors would want quizzes, modules, and interactivity. They wanted more than a PDF or a text file. A common conversation would be me saying, like, we, we have this platform, you can upload OER, and professors would want to host quizzes and share quizzes and have a streamlined way to get the grade automatically into their class. And I'd be like, you can upload a PDF, which was not very impressive. 
Um, when the Orange Grove launched, it was ambitious and it was trying to give professors and teachers what they wanted. It was trying to focus on high quality interactive content. And in 2004 to 2007, Flash was the way to be interactive on the internet. Um, Orange Grove was doing what professors and teachers wanted. So having that high quality made the material more ephemeral. Uh, the catch to it is interactive software objects are more ephemeral. Updates or changes in technology are far more likely to break interactive files than to break a text file or photograph. A text file or a static picture is easier to manage over time. Something interactive is part of a whole software ecosystem. And when that ecosystem ages out, pieces get lost and eventually the file won't run. Um, there's also statistical pressure. It's usually easier to pull quantitative than qualitative data. So um, there can be a lot of pressure if you have resources for something to go and put more stuff as opposed to go through and curate and remove outdated stuff or go over and update stuff and make sure something that was really nice five years ago is really nice today. Um, doing an ongoing editorial review process can be harder to justify, or it can be like, well, you had all this stuff. What did you actually do with it? You have the same thing as you had. Um, there can be pressure to add and never update or remove because of the way we measure statistics. Um, then finally, there are issues with um, maintenance, so maintaining software content and community. Um, maintenance is a huge issue for all digital libraries. There's stories always happening, which is where a project starts with grant funding and energy, and then it's supposed to convert to sustaining funding, but that never happens. Orange Grove is a little different in that it started as a seed project, then went and got funding. So the pre-launch 2004 to 2007 time period when there was a lot of buzz was not grant funded. Then it got a grant in 2007 through fund for the improvement of post-secondary education, and that went to funding a repository platform. But there's still that concept of going and seeking funding and the concept of infusions of cash, especially cash for something new rather than cash for long-term maintenance or something permanent. The grant actually went to buying the Pearson Aquila platform, which had high annual costs. And at the end of the grant, so following that startup period, 2004 to 2007, with content and community, and then a grant to provide the technological in infrastructure, um, all of those parts were in place but there wasn't an endowment to maintain them over time. Um, going back to the bright guiding principles that were in place when, um, which launched the Orange Grove, basically these principles didn't get sustaining funding. Um, there was sustained funding to keep the repository updated and the actual software element that was hosting that content and letting people log in and interact with it was maintained, but there wasn't ongoing funding to do updates to content, maintain the community. And over the years, new things happened with the Orange Grove brand, but the entire workflows content and community at launch languished without resources for maintenance. We are over 10 minutes, okay. but again, we do have some time left in the hour and we don't have any questions okay. yet in the Q&A, so please continue. Okay, so a common theme in digital libraries is that ultimately beyond collections and platforms, what's being built is a brand. In open education, we've seen that with Harvard's H2O re relaunching multiple times with the same theme, but with different content and software. Um, Florida at the state level is still doing work with OER and it's, it's still a focus. I had thought that there was a possibility to roll over the Orange Grove into a brand, but now I'm not so sure. FLVC let the URL for the original Orange Grove repository expire this year, just about a month ago. Um, Orange Grove was not hosted there at the end. It had been moved to a different URL, but this URL, theorangegrove.org, had a lot of incoming links from way back when, and in a sense, it was part of the brand. To me, letting expire means that it's likely that the brand will be de decommissioned along with the repository. Um, there's extremely likely to be a similar project in the future, and those guiding principles are still valid today, but the name and the branding are likely to be new and different. So that is the Orange Grove postmortem. I guess, are there questions? Thank you so much. I had completely forgotten about Flash. Um, we had some some great comments in the chat. Um, you know, the funding, when we think about sustainability of OER, um, we often think about funding and like the labor, right? Our theme for this year, but also in terms of 
um, what, as you mentioned, like uh, digital libraries often struggle with keeping things updated so that they are still accessible and usable. Um, that's incredible. Um, we do have, it is now um, 154, so we have about five minutes left. If you have any questions, oh, there's one in the chat from Angela. Do you think funding more OER repositories is a good direction given that there are existing repositories? Good question. I would say funding should go towards maintenance, like long-term maintenance, as opposed to building something new. Because even when I say the brand got used for other things, it was kind of like chasing trends. Like if you have a model where you're going to go get grant funding, grants say it's a grant for these types of projects. And if you have your guiding principles and they don't match up, like it's it's not a, a model. I, I also, I do feel that having fewer projects that are sustained predictably is a better way to go than having more projects that are not as predictably sustained but it's it's hard to say like there's a content there's your platform and there's your community and each of those is kind of resourced at a different level yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense um, that's some great feedback. Wendy said this is one of the best conference sessions they've ever attended. So many important lessons and nice to know. Not the only one who's experienced failures with this, thanks to all the presenters. Um, I, I want to echo that. I think these fail and show whatever <laughs> show and fail. Sorry, I, I mixed the words up. Show and fail sessions are so interesting um, because I think we learn more from failure than our successes. And I think it also um, helps us understand that we're not the only ones. Um, it looks like Nathan has a question. These issues are very labor intensive. Where should those human resources come from? It's a good question. Anyone have any thoughts? I, yeah. Hi, this is Angela. I, I have a thought on this. Um, I think that eventually, you know, something's got to break. You know, um, it, just hearing all the other presenters in this in this in this session, you know, we're talking about I did all of these things. You know, the marketing, the I wrote this thing. You know, and I think that we're all having to take on a lot of these really labor intensive tasks. And um, I think eventually, you know, we've got to face that. The fact that we cannot keep these things up, you know, do a high qual and, and deliver high quality results, or, or we might, you know, we might, heaven forbid, need more staff, you know? That's where I am. Angela, I, this is Meredith. I would uh, piggyback off of that and say I'm not actually like an MLS librarian, I was a, a GA, but I think that charging a graduate assistant with essentially building those first fundamental blocks of an OER program for an entire university of 22,000 plus students was something of a burden <laughs> for me. Like I was terrified that I was going to screw it up. Um, but I also just think it's interesting and I'm not sure what the solution is that, you know, one of the presenters was actually a scholarly um, communications and, and librarian. And that's one of the things that we talked about if we were able to fund that type of librarian for our library system, that that would fall under their set of responsibilities, but that it was still a difficult procedure despite having that title and kind of that under the auspices of your job description. In the meantime, the library's OER stuff is under me, who is the first year experienced librarian under the logic from our associate dean that first year students use OER. And I feel like that kind of logic is pretty endemic in universities right now is find someone existing that can do it. We don't need to fund someone else. Yeah. Uh, that that just like hits me in the feelings of um, that that kind of labor, DEI kind of labor, and it's all interconnected, right? Student success, first year students, and yeah, we tend to overburden one position or one department. Um, it is uh, a, a minute till, so I am going to say thank you all for joining us today for our show and fail session. I am going to stop recording, and at this point, if we want to have...